Welcome to the Conflict of Defense Podcast. I'm your host, Connor Sherman, and today I am exceptionally excited for our guest, Tazeen, the founder of Cyber Collective. She's a digital privacy advocate and an active board member in the security community. I don't know where you get the time, but Taz, welcome and thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's my honor. I, I'm really happy to be here. So you and I have had so many conversations about just what it means for security and privacy in this, you know, calling it a digital age makes me sound like a six year old, but like, you know, we have this explosion of influence happening on social platforms. And there are people having incredible social change and they're doing this through Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. And there, but there's a, there's a cost to this. And so I wanted to get your thoughts and I'm really excited to have you on show about this so we can unpack some of the both security and privacy concerns about this. Now, one of the things that we, uh, as I was doing the research and pre preparation for the show I came across was there, like back in March, an article was run where Social Blue Book, well, they as a platform were hacked and they exposed the identity of influencers of 217,000 social influencers. So like on a macro scale, you can see how like this consolidation of one person has an issue, all these voices are at risk. And then on an individual influ um, in the individual basis, we're seeing like where social influencers or voices are not protected. And so their accounts are getting hacked and they're being held for ransom on Instagram and things of like that information. So I just wanted to unpack with you and just kind of talk about what are some of the challenges that you know, you're seeing with social influences and those who want to create positive um, change? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think there are a couple of layers to all of, all of that question and, and how we can approach it. But the biggest is, you know, the number one method of attack right now is through social engineering. And these influencers are so susceptible to that because all of their information is public, right? And they are putting themselves out there. Um, the more authentic you are as a brand, right? The um, more viewers you get. And so these influencers are left between, at least when I talk to them, um, they say that they're between a rock and a hard place because they want to keep themselves secure, but they don't know how because they don't have private lives and they don't necessarily yeah. understand that, well, privacy and security are two very separate things, right? They're not, they are similar, but not synonymous to each other. Um, but it's been it's been an interesting uh, conversation with all of them um, and how we as a security industry also look at the kind of consumer market as it relates to security and privacy and how it reaches individuals. Um, and there, there's a lot of education that needs to happen. A ton of education. Totally. And you let's 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 actually just unpack that for a second. This idea that the security community and the consumer market, if there's one word that comes to mind, it's abandoned. Like yes. the, like the security community just does not pay attention to consumer products because it's distributed and difficult, in my opinion. And you know, it's distributed and difficult, and there's no money in it. Right. You can't go charge somebody whatever the salary is to go protect them. And they're like, but I just want to use these apps. I just want to use these systems. So really what's happening is the very people who are creating the software that's collecting all of our data are also in charge of the security of that system and the integrity of that data all the way through. So I don't call it conflict of interest. I just call it like an abandonment. Like we just have kind of given yeah. up on everybody. One hundred percent. And then it's hard to even when I first started, I guess, working more directly with consumers through Cyber Collective and doing the awareness and education, um, I still sometimes will stumble up, like, up on my words as far as direction to tell an individual how to stay secure. And that's the question that consumers have is, what do I do as an individual to stay secure? And a lot of the answers are associated with the mediums that they leverage on a daily basis. and. Um, the trust that they put into those mediums. And so who has ownership of staying mm. secure? If I'm using these devices, if I'm using an Apple device, is it my responsibility to get an additional program or software to keep my device more secure, right? Yeah. And so figuring out how to answer those questions, it took me a minute <laughs> to try and navigate because as an enterprise security um consultant, right? I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. And I 
there was a big learning curve because enterprise security is very different than consumer security. It, it, it almost, I feel like it's two separate languages <laughs> in a sense. Yeah. I mean, you can't talk to somebody about identity access management when really what you want to say is like two-round, two-factor authentication. And then you're like, wait, that text message they give you with those six digits, that's a good thing. Or, or more importantly, hey, that six digit, actually there are weaknesses in that. So we need to step it up to push notifications or one-time pins. So like this is whole linguistic education has to come through. 100%. Yeah. And consumers have been um, just set up for convenience technology left and right. Everything that comes our way now, technology has been leveraged for convenience. And so all of a sudden you have somebody telling them, hey, this convenience may be a detriment to you. And then you're putting a dark cloud around all of the, the nice like DoorDash, one button, one click, immediate, instant. Um, so yeah. that's hard to also kind of wrap their minds around. And then on top of it, not only are we telling you that the convenience applications might be vulnerable, but hey, we need you to do two or three extra things yes. to keep yourself more secure. So we're, not only are we going to tell you not to use your convenience apps, but we're also going to inconvenience you just a little bit. <laughs> exactly. I think it's, it, it highlights a broken system or let me put it, it highlights a system with different incentives. Yes. For sure. Yeah, they want, you know, we want the bar load to collect the, the data. So, I mean, this really brings us back to Cyber Collective. So you started on this mission a while ago to really, as I understood it, really democratize security information, right? So kind of move away from this idea that the security community has this secret information and you have to pay this really high bar to hire these individuals who then speak a unique language with unique problems. And you just said, okay, enough of that. We need real yes. information to real people. So if you could just unpack Cyber Collective, like its mission and your inspiration for getting started with that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you're one of the first people I called when that was kind of coming underway. So I know this is special to be able to share this on your show with you, especially after everything's come into kind of fruition. Um, mm -hmm. So Cyber Collective is, uh, simply put, a security and privacy um, awareness company rooted in helping millennials and um, all of the other kind of generational generations that come after and prior to millennials, but um, it's really focused in, like you said, bringing the information to the people from a voice and from voices that folks can align with and understand, right? Mm -hmm. um, hit the nail right on the head around the language. Like you go to these secret people with a secret language. And so, uh, you know, in the, in the age of our digital revolution, we're all using technology. And I think that um, it's not fair that the information isn't reaching consumers and that they don't understand that one, um, you are vulnerable and two, uh, the lack of privacy, which is a huge focus of Cyber Collective around the application for data protection and understanding what our privacy rights are from a technical perspective. Um, Do and we have we privacy rights? Is that a thing? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I get you. Every day. It's like we see things come to, we see like legislators trying, right? We see CCPA, we see CPRA coming out. And at some point you're just like, if we just had a common sense framework that we approached, we'd be in a different bucket. But anyway, I digress. Tell me more. So like, tell me like, well, that privacy story, I think is so important because you mentioned earlier about this idea of like, we are building technologies that enable us to have a more convenient experience. Well, to be convenient, you need to be predictable uh, or you need the prediction. And to have a prediction, you need data that you base that off of. And then there's all of this kind of like this um, dark mirror side of this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as someone who, can you actually, yeah, just expound on that. Like help me understand like the privacy fitting into this equation. Cause I see like two parts of this. So you have like these technologies, these incredible platforms where social influencers have this opportunity to really reach and influence um, a larger audience. Like I saw this with the use of Instagram when Black Lives Matter really got another wave this calendar year, right? It hasn't stopped and nor should it. But I noticed those huge uptake. I was like, this is great. But then this is like this quiet dark side of all that information that gets collected. So how, how, what's your views on that? And then what are some of your thoughts around protecting the, the privacy around that? Yeah, um, a lot of my efforts are rooted in philosophizing this entire um, 
two-headed sword almost of understanding that we almost need these platforms and and the influencers and it's it's an inevitable part of our society now but that lack of privacy and protection and, and lack of awareness of how it really fits into this larger narrative so with the movement and just conversations around secure digital security with um protests that were happening and there was a lot of dialogue around that or um right people were starting to take notice that, wow, I can be tracked. I can be surveilled. And I think, you know, this uptick in the dialogue around surveillance and security really happened with COVID as well. Once people were home and understanding how dependent we are on the internet and the digital world. Um, and so just my thoughts around that is one, it takes a lot more <laughs> than sometimes for me at least pot one hour sessions in podcasts to be able to explain where my brain is with all of this <laughs> yes. um, because it is so uh, layered and delicate and tangential with all mm -hmm. of the different moving parts that surround it. And so um, I, I think that I, I think a lot about ethics and uh, when it comes to these conversations and teaching people uh, the lack of ethics that I think exists right now as it relates to our digital world and the media platforms that we use. And then on the other hand, um, the responsibility that we have to build those ethics yeah. around what's going on. Um, hmm. I don't know if I answered your question. No, that's a really good point. I, you, you highlighted something that is a, a, fle a fledgling concept in the security industry which is or the engineering community i should say specifically which is this privacy by design but what i like about what you're saying is it's more like ethics by design so when you are coding something when you are deliberate when you're creating the user experience when you're creating the code that's going to develop that and the collection of those ports of data that we don't think about co data collection after the fact we think about it up front we think about what are the choices we're presenting to people and the ethical implications therein up front, not after the fact. And I think what we're really asking, what we're kind of coming to here is we're really saying, if these tech companies are gonna to continue to be, hold the market share of our time and our attention and really our enablement for engagement, then they take on the responsibility of making sure that there's a standard of ethics and privacy baked into what they're doing. Um, and if they're, well, I would say if they're not willing to do that, that leads to another conversation of like, okay, then you're no longer appropriate custodians of that. Um, but if they're if they are willing to, that's where we need to move to as well. So helping these larger right. enterprises move towards that. And they're put right com compliance wise. GDPR is out. CCPA is coming out. And they're pushing compliance, but I still think there's a huge gap. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. And and the gap is just humanizing it. Right I, there, it, I read this book. I don't know if you've read it. It's called the Phoenix Phoenix Project. I read love that it. book. Love, love that, that book so much. Right, and so. You think about that book and and how change management processes are siloed, right? And they're each vertical within an organization mm -hmm. is running their own entire little business units and they're not having dialogue with each other. And I think as security professionals, we face that all the time, right? All of the different business units that aren't considering security and whatnot. But yeah. um from the you know you talk about the ethics and enterprise or technology companies that should adhere to certain ethics but i think the, the bigger problem is so much more um i don't i don't it's so much more human and behavioral and point. psychological than it is technical right mm. and with the security industry um we just we're focused on the policy and we follow the policy and we develop that we do the threat modeling, we assess the risk, and then we implement a plan, right? Yes, it's like, I think maybe this is one of the problems with what we have with the security and privacy engineer, the privacy community is we're a bunch of engineers trying to solve a human problem. And yeah. it's like, actually what you need are like advocates and people who are passionately connected to other human beings. Um, you know, jokingly, a, a colleague of mine said when COVID started and he runs a large engineering team, he was just like, wait, 
all my engineers have to work from home indefinitely. It's like they've been preparing for this for years, like never speak yeah. to another human again, just stare at a computer. Um, but to your point, it's like there's so much humanity involved in the decision making in the, all this that requires that. Um, so just circle back on the Phoenix Project for listeners. I will put show notes in here uh, yeah. and link you to it. Incredible book by Gene Kim. And really, I think the ethos here was a transformation of an old problem to enable people. And that's what we're looking for as we're talking about privacy is like a transformation where it's like, you can't just say, let's implement the same thing faster. You need to do it differently. Like release management it needs, is different than change management. And so in the same way that we need, like privacy needs to be different than, um, you can't just keep throwing legislation on the problem as well. There needs to be a human element there. And I think it needs to come out of the groups that it lives in. I think it needs to, who talks about privacy and how we develop privacy hmm. um, compliance needs to come from a more diverse population that are representative of That's really large good point. communities, right? And it's this elitist industry, it's academics and people that have PhDs in policy and risk. Wait, and you mean that tech billionaires may not be the best person to talk about how real people are using real technology? <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> But you talk about, so let's unpack education for a second. Um, and I do want to come back to that. Um, that's one of the things I love about our show is we can kind of go anywhere we need to. And yeah, come for back. sure. So we talk about privacy. Um, in both GDPR and CCPA and future CPRA, they all require and expect an educated population. Like they give you, like the legislation doesn't do privacy for you. It effectively says, all it's done is saying, if you are an informed consumer, I think this is the mission of Cyber Collective, right? To be have an informed audience, an informed, pla informed bunch of people, um, an audience of people. Um, because what you now have some labors you can pull. This is wonderful. Hey, I want the right to be forgotten or the right to not be tracked or whatever it is. But it requires an informed audience. And if you don't know you have those levers to begin with, you know, it's almost as if nothing changed. So. I think that just kind of goes back to the mission of what you're talking about with Cyber Collective is that if we stand, if we want to take advantage of the levers we have, even if they're kind of broken and you know not as in, in, impactful as we would hope for, it starts with us as individuals and the consumers of these platforms recognizing that we do have some rights, we do have some tools now that we can use, and we do have some levers that we can pull. And I promise you, even though in the security industry, having been on the sales side, we avoided small businesses and nonprofits because they simply didn't have the money. So they didn't get the information that they needed about security. Um, the consumer market and consumer security technology is going to be the next wave. And I really believe that because privacy policies are being implemented. Consumers are starting to ask questions and pay attention. And these enterprise companies are going to be scurrying around trying to figure out how to connect with the consumers and right now it's so disconnected um so that yeah. i i really see that coming and and if security companies and vendors don't start taking on the consumer connection i i don't i don't i think they're gonna they're gonna have a um they're gonna lose a very viable market almost you know yeah i think i i am I will t cautiously share your optimism that in the near future, we'll have a population who's asking and demanding for these things. Um, it kind of see, I had some co clients of mine in Germany and I was working with them and they were just as kind of part of the conversation, they are more informed, more educated around privacy and more and cared a lot more about privacy. They weren't just kind of taking things at face value. Um, and they just kind of spoke a little bit, maybe just to different cultural um, expectations of technology providers. Um, yeah, so that, so I guess that is an indicator of optimism is going to come across the Atlantic and make its way across. Um, yeah. And that we will also in the U.S. have those same requirements, those same design, design, des desires is the word I'm looking for from these uh, technology companies. So on that note, I mean, like going after the, not going after, it sounds like a sales thing, but like educating and supporting and helping these creatives, like um, what was why focus there right you could have had so many other avenues to focus in on what was it about the creative community and the social change community that really got your attention 
My heart has always been in that community. So I, I would start there. I come from a family of creatives. My brother is a musician. All of my friends are journalists, musicians, artists, um, writers. And so I'm the oddball in the group that does what I do. Um, and as I learned more about security and as I continued to build my relationships with my creative friends and the more successful they became, the more I saw their need for security and their lack of knowledge and that conversation. And, you know, naturally it would come up all the time. And then I just realized that gap. It was just very simple that, wow, these people that I have such love for, mm -hmm. their intellectual property is at constant risk. Um, they are when I see, so I'll, I'd be sitting there with some of my friends and they're just using public Wi-Fi to do um, payment transactions. And I'm like, what What are you doing right now? Why are you doing this in my presence? And they're like, what, what's wrong? What am I doing? And so that those little at anecdotal moments that I've had with my peers and my family members, mm -hmm. it really pushed me like, hey, I need to communicate and educate this community because it's my it's my people. I need to let my people know what's up with all of this and the, and the information is not reaching. And um, I speak their language. And so I think that that's a big part of, there's just, we, we just play up these ideas of what things have to be and how we communicate them. And I, it doesn't reach the audience. And so I figured yeah. I, I'm, I'm a good middleman for the job <laughs> and, and that's really that's really what pushed me and drove me is my just my own creative passion and wanting to help other people yep because a 10 um a tw 10 to 20 page powerpoint deck does not communicate well with a loved one you're like <laughs> oh i really want to help improve your uh, your password security please read this document this nist article uh revision special publication so and so so that you can understand password requirements I'm like they're not gonna yeah. do that. We can barely get people in the security community to read the things that we wrote ourselves. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And on the other hand, it also made gave me an outlet to feel like I could finally be myself because in the security industry I didn't always have at least I, I still don't always I have safe people, mm -hmm. but I'm not completely myself with everybody and that's really important to me. Um and so being able to find my voice through this process as well has been really helpful um, because I just, it, it was just, you know, I wanna use words like bullshit in certain meetings because things are bullshit. And <laughs> why can't I just say that, <laughs> right? Yep, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I love the fact, I think it's beautiful that you found your voice helping people defend their voice. Mm, and mm. yeah, I think that is just an incredible thing that you've done with the Cyber Collective and just, you know, giving yourself permission to be you in public, you know, good things happen when that, when Taz is unleashed on the world, you know, <laughs> you, you've seen it. <laughs> it's the best. So like, let's talk about this. So we've got a, um, what was some of the advice that you would give for, you know, we look for someone who is a creative, someone who is looking for social change, someone who is looking to use social media to boost and leverage a message out what are some of the things that they should be doing to defend their voice and protect that, well, their reputation, that protect that social network? What are some of the things? I think a, a big thing that I've been trying to push is um, mindfulness uh, around what you're clicking and what you're touching online. I, I'm really trying to kind of bring in this idea of conscious clicking is and I'm trying to coin that and, and move away from the realm of convenience clicking and convenience technology. Hmm. Um, and so when I preach conscious clicking to creatives, I try to really bring it into the way that they might be able to think. And I say, you know, when you are going through your creative process, what type of um, what is your own creative process look like and try to apply that same methodology and, and the yeah. emotions that you go through when you're looking at your online presence, right? How protective are you of your actual song that you wrote that you're not ready to release? Be just as protective of um, your credit card information, please, <laughs> in the in the same yeah. right. And so I think it starts with 
allowing them the um, the resources to try to learn about social engineering attacks, which is where that mindful consciousness and conscious clicking comes in. The second is um, I try to talk to them about, you know, access and depending on what mediums they're using, what type of access you do you give other people and are you thinking about, are you looking at it as if you have a team, you're not working with that person anymore, but do they still have access into your Google Drive? Have you gone in and removed the access of people that you shared a link with back in the day? I have to go through that process myself and it's so simple, but it does make a really big difference in um, your potential for vulnerability, right? Because at least then you can control your own device and you don't have to worry about somebody else's and access into your work through their maybe malicious device. Um, and then uh, the other is just around encrypted file sharing. And I try to make sure that they understand sending things over public Wi-Fi that's really important to you <laughs> and just doing it willy-nilly is probably not the best idea. And there are tools that exist that allow you to do this in a safe way. So I try to keep it simple with them, but really the goal is to have a conversation and, and have them understand the why behind all of this. And that's where that whole um, convenience versus conscious cooking dialogue comes into play. That's That makes sense. I really, every time someone understands why they're doing it, I think it's gonna be 10 times more effective than a list of like, hey, these are the top 10 things or here's the, whatever the case is. Because if we recognize that as, if someone recognizes that the most invaluable thing on social media may just be very much the voice that they have, right? That when they post something, people expect it to come from that individual. And if your account gets hacked or somebody starts posting things on your behalf, right? And they start putting this up, like we can so easily ruin and betray that trust that's taken a while to build up, right? Because there's a lot of people saying a lot of things on social media. So when you want to trust someone on social media, that takes time to, as you talked at the top of the interview here, it's like building that off, having an authentic experience that leads to trust and how quickly that trust can be um, eroded if we don't protect our, ourselves and our accounts um, publicly on those public facing mediums. 100% or understand how, what we share, you know, different markers around our room, just being cognizant and aware um, of things that might give certain details about you away. And maybe you don't care. So then that means go back and call your credit card companies or your banking um, right. organizations and change your security answers and lie, make something up, but just I have my favorite technique to tell people. Like you yeah. don't have to tell the truth on what street you grew up on. I'm like, right. my, my stuff lies all the time. I have a, I have a password safe and I still, I put my lies in my password safe. Right. Right. And that's it. But think about that process going back to the security and privacy industry and who's building that privacy compliance. Have they not gotten the gist that, Hey, we should probably change these security questions because this is public information. Now the, the first street that you lived on is public, right? The last four, di four digits of your social is public your address, your phone number, your full name, your maiden name, all of that is public information. But these large enterprises continue to use those same style questions to secure these accounts, knowing that social engineering is a thing. So right, that gap going back to the Phoenix project, it's where is the gap in communication and, and what are they thinking about when making these processes? Um, and do they really have the consumer's data protection in mind? And in my opinion, I, I don't think they do. No, no, I, 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 I will take a bolder stand and say, no, we don't. What, we have, what they're doing is they had a mandate to implement risk-based authentication. And someone said, hey, I Googled risk-based authentication and I came up with these questions, let's just give them this. Yeah. Versus having any insight into the actual protection, the efficacy of the control, or the ability to reduce risk at an individual level. 100%. My dad the other day, he thought that if he didn't give the bank the real answer that the bank would know it wasn't him as far as the security question is concerned. I was right. like, Baba, you can lie. He was like, I cannot lie because it is not the truth. 
I was like, but Baba, that's public information. So you don't have to give that information to right. the bank. And he said that, oh, they're not, he thought he was being tested. Right, no, it's like, it's your it's safeguard, you not the bank's validation of you, yeah. So you think about that, think about that disconnect. There's no way he's the only one. He's the only old guy out here thinking this in these streets. There are no. a lot of people, a lot of immigrants, a lot of people from different communities that have a different learning capacity and capability, right? And how are they getting that information? Um, it breaks my heart sometimes. Like that's really, you know, you ask me what drives me and motivates me. I think about that and it, and it makes me so sad that they don't have that information. They're not being educated. And then they're the ones that are um, ripped off and they get scammed and they give their money away or something. And they probably needed that so bad, you know? Yeah, it's those who are closest to the edge that get pushed the hardest. And... Mm, I love that quote. And it's just, it's just, it's an inappropriate thing in our society that we would not think about that, you know, not just have a compassionate human forward centric thing. But again, that's my little soapbox. But yeah. it's a, so, um, I mean, you were talking about mindful, conscious clicking, sorry, conscious clicking. I think that is a beautiful phrase. I'm, I'm definitely going to put that in my repository. Um, you know, so when we talk about like education as well, like we're coming up to the National Cybersecurity Awareness Month which is wonderful, but cybersecurity is a 12 month thing. It's not just a one month thing. So right. as great as many enterprises out there are saying, hey, we're gonna do this once, you know, don't click these links, don't do this, don't do that. Um, what we need is also what you're doing with Cyber Collective is stop telling us what not to do. You start telling us what to do, how to do this, how to consume this, how to use these technologies well. So I just wanna thank you so much for the incredible content you put out there. Um, I've seen it on Instagram, I've seen it on LinkedIn, I've seen it on Twitter. I like, I see every play as I go. I like, I see you guys. So this is really incredible. So mm -hmm. on that note, if the audience wants to start getting a hold of this information, sharing it with their friends, sharing it with their neighbors, where should they be going to find out more about Cyber Collective? Um, they can go to uh, www.cybercollective.org. For right now, we're relaunching um, our website, but you can find our social media handles on that page. Um, and then we're on Twitter, and our handle is Get Psycho. So I, I love that <laughs> very awesome. much. It's our it's our go to. Um, and then you can also find me on Twitter, um, and I go by Tech with Taz. So all of the information lives under either Get Psycho or Tech with Taz. Fantastic. And I will link to all of the socials in the show notes so everyone can follow up with that. But awesome. thank you so much for your time, Taz. Um, I really appreciate you kind of stepping away from all the responsibilities that you have right now to just to take 45 minutes and unpack this with us. So thank you again. No, thank you. I'm honored to be here and I appreciate you, Connor, always. You're welcome. Till next time. <laughs>